good evening doctors good evening ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining this evening my name is shundraj balle ganesh rao and i am your moderator for today's webinar titled revolutioning glaucoma care unleashing the power of offline smartphone ai we have variety diverse participants here general ophthalmologists glaucoma specialist post graduate students optometrists diabetologists well we have a, a very truly exciting and informative session planned for you i want to extend a warm, warm welcome to each and every one of you before i begin i would like to go over some housekeeping rules throughout the presentation if you have any questions or comments we encourage you to utilize the q and a feature located at the bottom of your zoom window simply type your questions in a q and a box and our team will do the best to address it during the designated q and a session now let me give you a brief overview of what you can expect from today's agenda we will be deep diving into various aspects of glaucoma care with a focus on how technology particularly ai artificial intelligence is transforming the landscape of diagnosis screening and management first up we have dr divya rao who will be talking about bridging the vision gap leveraging technology for glaucoma screening dr divya will explore how innovative technologies are revolutionizing the way we screen for glaucoma particularly in understand in under underserved communities next we have dr shujini and she will be talking behind ima image grading uncovering missed cases in image evolutions um e image evaluations <laughs> um dr shujini will be deep diving into intricacies of image eval evaluations and highlighting the importance of detecting subtle signs of glaucoma following that we have dr shirsha sendel who will be talking about eyes of tomorrow joag and childhood glaucoma dr shirsha will share insights into unique challenges posed by childhood glaucoma and how advancements in technology are shaping pediatric glaucoma care our journey continues with dr swati who will be discussing about community impact scalability of glaucoma ai for screening dr swati will talk about the scalability part of the glaucoma technology and its potential to reach and serve high risk population through community screening finally we will wrap up our presentation with a dynamic panel discussion featuring our esteemed experts in the field of ophthalmology our panelists include dr kavita from aravinda hospital mr florin ai expert from remedio and our speakers together they will deep dive into challenges and opportunities presented by ai in glaucoma care and answer any burning questions you may have with that i encourage you to actively participate ask questions and engage in a fruitful discussions the first presentation will be by dr divya dr divya will be discussing about bridging the vision gap vision gap leveraging technology for glaucoma screening dr divya completed her ophthalmology fellowship at lb prasada institute she has won many awards including the prestigious global innovation summit award and she has featured in many peer review publications she is currently the medical director overseeing the ai development and clinical research at remedio without further ado i re i request dr divya to share her screen dr divya the floor is yours Hello everyone. Are you able to see my screen, Shunraj? Yes, we can able to see your screen and then we can hear you as well. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us everyone and for the kind introduction. So let us see how technology can help solve this challenging problem of glaucoma screening. Uh my disclosure is I've led the development of this technology along with my team at Remedio.
So as we all know, glaucoma is the leading cause of, of global irreversible blindness. And with the aging population, the prevalence of this disease is projected to increase to about 112 million by 2040. And what is even more alarming is that 90% of glaucoma is undetected in developing countries like India. And at the time of presentation, 50% are advanced with 20% of them being blind. While the prevalence, global prevalence stands to be a 3.5%, as you can see here, as age advances, the prevalence also increases. And Asian countries account for over 60% of the global burden. Further complicating this problem is the acute shortage of ophthalmologists, let alone glaucoma specialists. And if left alone, it can lead to irreversible blindness and has undue consequences on quality of life and financial implications as well. To add to this is the complexity of the disease itself, and the diagnosis is not simple. To diagnose glaucoma, one needs to take a careful history, clinical exam is important, fundus evaluation, intraocular pressure measurement, gonioscopy, visual field measurement, and um, OCT is also required. Now, not all ophthalmology clinics have all of this equipment and in the community, none of this exists. On one hand, we understand the complexity in diagnosis, but on the other hand, we also know and there's sufficient evidence now that glaucoma screening can be cost effective in developing countries, but so far there is no ideal tool that is accurate or cost effective enough for screening. Given that in most cases, uh, typically structural changes precede functional loss, this led us to hypothesize whether a portable, simple to use cost-effective fundus camera with integrated AI can ensure timely referrals. So the idea was to screen for glaucoma as secondary prevention before the patient becomes uh, symptomatic and identify those with measurable structural and functional change and those who would benefit from immediate intervention. So before going into the solution itself, let's briefly understand what is AI this, this, uh, and deep learning. So AI is the development of computer programs that basically mimic human intelligence without requiring or requiring very minimal human input. And deep learning is um, comes under the umbrella of artificial intelligence and is one of the most powerful AI tools that is currently being used. It uses a data-driven approach to teach a computer how to solve a problem. So you give an input and you give the desired output and the computer learns to solve the task by itself. The input data is filtered through multiple layers and each layer output acts as an input to the next layer. And it's a large connection, a collection of mathematical functions which are arranged like the way the neurons are in the brain and hence the name convolutional neural networks. Now, if you were to take glaucoma as an example, if you feed in fundus images and um, have the ground truth of glaucoma or not, the deep learning models essentially learn the relevant patterns to make an output of glaucoma and the weights are essentially optimized such, as the, such that the prediction error um, is very small and the predicted classification is as close to the ground truth as possible. Now, there are several applications of AI in ophthalmology, right from anterior to posterior segment. But if we were to broadly look at what are the different tasks that AI can do, um, it's the classification tasks like for example, binary classification, presence or absence of disease is possible. It can do segmentation where you can look at, for example, segmenting blood vessels and giving quantifiable measurements uh, or outlining the cup to disc. Um, then it can look at feature detection and give staging of disease or transfer learning approaches can be used to look at disease progression. But for today's talk, we'll stick to screening and glaucoma. Now, what makes glaucoma screening challenging? If we were to look at these two images and look at which of these images have diabetic retinopathy, I'm very sure all of us would be able to identify uh, the, the hemorrhages and the hard exudates, and we know that the image on the left has diabetic retinopathy. 
Now let's do a small exercise. Let's have uh, 30 seconds to look at these three images and let's see how, if we are able to identify which of these images have glaucoma. If uh, Shonrad, you can start the poll and give about 30 seconds. Let's see um, how the participants do on this. Yeah, the poll is started. So we have three images and let's see which of these images actually have glaucoma and how technology can help us in identifying glaucoma using fundus images. Shonraj, I hope you're keeping the time. I'm not very sure. Just let me know when it's done. Yeah, Dr. Dewey, we've given, we've given them 50 seconds. We'll end it right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have the poll that has come out and it's like majority of them think that the center and right image has glaucoma. So actually, if you see, the center image does not have glaucoma. It's the right and the left image that has glaucoma. And here you can see that the AI is actually highlighting areas that are abnormal. There are excavations and early RNFL defects that the uh, AI has picked out. We'll learn a little bit more about it as we go along. So the AI develop runs on a smartphone-based fundus camera that's very simple to use. The operator essentially captures a disk or macula centered image and runs the AI analysis. The system is deployed completely offline. That means it does not require internet for inferencing and one can get a report in about 10 seconds. So the AI has been developed with several thousands of images uh, for, uh, that have been used at the time of training. And the ground truth also includes the final diagnosis provided by a glaucoma specialist at the end of comprehensive evaluation, essentially allowing the AI to learn beyond fundus images from modalities like OCT. So when we look at what are the main components of this AI, uh, once a disk or macular centered image is captured, there is a cropping algorithm that looks at the region of interest, uh, there is also a quality check algorithm that runs parallelly, which will alert the operator if the image is sufficient quality or not. Then we have two algorithms running simultaneously. One, a segmentation model that outlines the cup and disc and gives the uh, estimated vertical cup to disc ratio. And the classification model that looks at typical features uh, that one would look for during an exam, that is the structural changes on the optic nerve head, or the RNFL changes to make a decision of referral or not. So I'm just going to play a short video on how the AI actually works. Diabetic retinopathy has always been easy and quick. Now with the help of AI, you can also screen for glaucoma. All you need to do is capture a discentered image for both eyes and click on Glaucoma Analysis. The images will be carefully analyzed for referable glaucoma and a vertical cup to disc ratio measurement will be generated. Along with this information, the report will also highlight the abnormal areas. If you look here, you can see that the AI has picked up an early retinal nerve fiber layer defect that anyone could easily miss. Aside from the standard procedure of analyzing vertical cup to disc ratio, the AI also analyzes and highlights several key features that a specialist would look for during an optic disc exam. And the best part is that all of this works even when you're offline. So who can use this solution, right? 
So ophthalmologists can use this in the clinic when they don't have other equipment to augment decision making. It can be used by health workers in the community for screening, it can be used by glaucoma specialists for photo documentation and to see the changes over time. It can also be used for teaching and training of residents and fellows. On whom can I use this AI? As we all know, glaucoma is a low prevalent disease. Even with a good performing tool, the positive predictive value can be very low in the general population. Hence, uh, the idea is to do a high risk group screening for anyone over the age of 40 years, those who have family history of glaucoma or comorbidities or other risk factors like steroid use who had injuries or other ocular surgeries. So now based on the context in which the AI is being used, the screening model can be optimized. It can be used in clinics by ophthalmologists when there are no sophisticated equipment like OCT and HVF. And it can augment the ophthalmologist decision as a clinical decision support tool to identify cases who can then be referred to a specialist. It can be used in vision centers, secondary centers in the community uh, by nurses, optometrists or operators who could capture the images, run the AI. And when there is no availability of a teleophthalmologist, the decision of the AI, that is the autonomous use of the AI, can be used to make a referral. And when a teleophthalmology uh, opportunity is present, the images can be viewed on the Cloud Connect system, and then the patients can be referred to the um, glaucoma specialist for the positive cases. So it is very essential to emphasize that the AI report is a screening report and does not eliminate the need to visit an ophthalmologist whose decision would be final. So prior to deployment of this AI, it has um, been validated in multiple prospective studies on now more than 1,000 subjects across uh, different institutes, both within the tertiary hospital and vision centers at Nanai Netralia, Arvind, and LVP. The AI has been compared, again, even though challenged with fundus images alone, it has been compared against stringent comprehensive specialist evaluation. And our first study that was done in Narayan Netralia, the results have already been published in both Journal of Glaucoma and Nature Eye. And the two recent studies uh, have also shown promising results with sensitivity of between 87 to 91% and specificity of 94 to 97%. This is a very busy table, but all I wanted to highlight here was that there are other global groups who have also looked at this. However, a lot of this has been research-based. The evaluations have been done on retrospective data sets, not on prospective studies, um, and they've used desktop systems. And the comparison has only been on image-based gra grading that we all know is not complete in the case of glaucoma. There's only been one group which has done uh, prospective studies in India. And if we compare the results, uh, the, our results have been very promising. So I just like to end by thanking all of our collaborators without whom this would not be possible. Some of them are there today here who are, are going to talk a little bit more of their experience and evaluations of the system. And I'd also like to thank my team without whom all of this would not have been possible. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll wait up at the end to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Divya, for that insightful presentation. Now, before we move on to our next presentation, if you have any questions to Dr. Divya, please feel free to type them in a QA and a box, and we will address them in a Q&A session. Next up, we have Dr. Shrijani Shrop from Narayan Netralaya who will be discussing behind my image grading, uncovering missed cases in image evaluation. Dr. Srijani, a glaucoma specialist in Nara Netralaya with seven years of experience. Uh, Dr. Srijani is committed to advancing surgical techniques in glaucoma, prioritizing patient education and contributing to research efforts. She completed her glaucoma fellowship at Aravind Eye Hospital Madurai she has she has received prestigious awards such as Dr. Sridhar Rao's award for young ophthalmologists. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Shrijani. 
Dr. Shrujini, the virtual floor is yours. Whenever you are ready, please start your presentation. Good evening, everyone. Is my uh, are my slides visible? Yes, your slides are visible and your audio is your audio is very clear. Okay, great. So, um, thank you, Dr. Devia, for this opportunity. And uh, my talk is mainly uncovering the missed cases in image uh, evaluation. So as Dr. Divya has already spoken about why we require AI and glaucoma, it's mainly to bridge the gap between our large population and the scarcity of uh, uh, scarcity of ophthalmologists and glaucoma specialists. So uh, why is glaucoma so um, uh, involved with AI? It's mainly because most of our diagnostic modalities are image-based, which makes it very suitable for AI design. So in this era of smartphones, uh, Remedio has designed an AI which can run offline on a smartphone, and it can be used by even a non-ophthalmologist, a non-glaucoma specialist, and any ophthalmologist in general. So this can make actually screening very effective uh, even in remote areas. So uh, with our collaboration, as Dr. Divya has already told, we have brought out two papers in Journal of Glaucoma and in Eye. So I'll be talking a little briefly about what the study actually showed. So this was a prospective cross-sectional study, which was done at Narayan Nethralaya. We used 243, uh, we included 243 subjects. And uh, this was mainly uh, the AI system output was either a referable glaucoma or a no referable glaucoma. Referable glaucoma were those which were confirmed glaucoma and needed an immediate referral. No referable glaucoma was a uh, dissuspects and, um, and normals. Dissuspects were mainly those which were non-urgent referral. So all patients underwent a detailed glaucoma evaluation, which included a slit lamp evaluation, IOP, um, a CAT, gonio, visual fields, disc photo, and an SDOCT. And uh, image grading was done by three fellowship trained uh, doctors. And the AI, uh, what we did was we studied how the AI output was against just the image grading compared to the clinician. And at the end of a clinical evaluation, a comprehensive clinical evaluation that included all these uh, uh, visual fields, disc photo and SDOCT. So these are our results. So if you can see, we uh, the sensitivity to pick up glaucoma was good. It was 93.7%. And there was very minimal over-referral of normal subjects. So what is interesting to note is that against just an image grading, when the same images were given to a specialist and to the AI, specialists detected 60%, while the AI detected 94% true glaucomas. So possibly it is that the AI has learned to detect subtle structural changes, which is not evident to the human eyes. So I'll be briefly discussing about a couple of examples on how the AI performance was. So this is the first case example. This was the image which was given to both the clinician and the AI. And the clinicians had to follow a strict predefined criteria for grading the images. So the um, at the end of the consensus image grading, it was no glaucoma at the consensus level, and the AI um, gave an output as a referable glaucoma. So when we look at the printout, we can see that um, if you can see these areas, these are the class activation maps, which are highlighted like heat maps. And what is even more interesting is that the VCDR was just around 0.6. But the class activation map has actually highlighted an abnormality beyond the VCDR. So this was actually the visual fields. We can see that there's a superior arcuate in the left eye. And we can see an RNFL defect and the GCIPL thinning on the OCT. This was actually a case of uh, PACG. And the IOP was 29 in the right eye and 25 in the left eye. And at the end of clinical evaluation, this was definitely glaucoma and had to be referred. So this is the second example. So at the end of a consensus image grading, it was no glaucoma in the right eye and glaucoma suspect in the left eye. At the AI glaucoma reference, uh, referral level, it was referable glaucoma. So to go further, when we look at the printout, we can see that the class activation maps have highlighted in both the eyes. So there was glaucoma in both the eyes, which is actually proved by even the visual fields, which had a superior arc rate in the right eye, and in the left eye, you can see a bi-arcuate scotoma. 
So the same thing, the OCT showed RNFL and GCIPL thinning. And this again was a referable glaucoma at the end of clinical evaluation. Uh, it was a confirmed glaucoma case. So this highlights how the AI could pick up even on those subtle changes which were seen even in the right eye. So this is the case example three. At the consensus image level uh, by the clinician, it was no glaucoma in the right eye. And in the left eye, it was a glaucoma suspect. But the AI had actually said that it was no referable glaucoma. So let's see if this was actually right or was there any difference after the reports, after the visual fields and the OCT. So this is how the printout was. So it says it's a no referable glaucoma. But before we go into the reports, we can see that there's an RNFL defect here and there's a small resolving disc hemorrhage. And this was what the visual field report said. It was a, There was a superior arcuate. And in the RNFL, uh, in the um, OCT, you can see an inferior RNFL thinning and a GCIPL thinning. So um, this means that probably the AI has not picked up a lot of early glaucoma, but it had very good sensitivity in picking up moderate and advanced glaucoma. And these are the cases that we shouldn't be missing. These are the cases which have to be referred to a center or treated well. And this can be up so that we can prevent blindness in these patients. So to highlight how uh, actually this AI, uh, AI model picked up just beyond the VCDR. So if we, uh, if we see the printout in this example, the VCDR was just around 0.4, but it, the left eye showed a pale disc with diffuse RNFL loss. This was a case of a post acute enclosure attack. And this, the AI picked it up as a referable glaucoma, which was the right diagnosis. So this shows that there was advanced field effect in the left eye and same, even with the OCT, there was diffuse RNFL and GCIPL thinning. This, were, this is my last example, which shows that a uh, lot of cases in myopia and tilted disc, it's challenging even for a clinician to pick up if it's actually glaucoma or no glaucoma. So the, uh, so the AI tool has ha actually highlighted the areas of abnormality, like the peripapillary atrophy, so that it can be referred. Uh, so these kind of cases actually require a glaucoma specialist or an ophthalmologist to actually evaluate further, do the necessary investigations like the HFA, OCT, intraocular pressure, so that we have a better idea if we need to treat these patients or follow up. So in summary, I just want to say that artificial intelligence has become an integral part in glaucoma care necessitating the ongoing education on its utility and advancements, and hence this webinar. The offline tool developed by Remedio, integrating fundus imaging on a mobile device, demonstrates promising effi uh, efficiency in glaucoma screening. And by employing deep neural networks on a portable platform, this technology can be used by everyone, just um, not just a glaucoma specialist, by an ophthalmologist, general ophthalmologist, or even at a peripheral center. Its excellent sensitivity in detecting moderate and advanced stages of glaucoma, it underscores its role in facilitating timely referrals to prevent blindness because these are the patients who require to be referred immediately because if we treat them early, we can definitely prevent their blindness. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swajani, for that enlightening presentation. Before we proceed, if you have any questions to Dr. Shrajini, please continue to type them in a Q&A box and we will address them in a Q&A session. Next on agenda, we have Dr. Shirisha Sethil from Edvi Prasad Eye Institute, who will be shedding light on eyes of tomorrow, JOAG and childhood glaucoma. Dr. Shirisha Sethil's ex expertise in pediatric glaucoma offers a promising values and insight into this specialized field. Dr. Shirisha Sendel, who doesn't need any much of introductions. She is currently heading glaucoma services at LB Prasad Eye Institute. She completed her postgraduate training in ophthalmology from Aravind Eye Hospital, Madurai. She has secured first rank in ophthalmology from that university. Dr. Sendel earned her FRCS in ophthalmology from Edinburgh in 2000 and pursued a fellowship in glaucoma at LBPI. Dr. Sendel has appeared in several peer-reviewed publications and has received Best Paper Award in various conferences. Without further ado, Dr. Shirisha Sendhal, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Shonraj. And wonderful, wonderful uh, session until now. 
So Dr. Divya and Shrujini had actually uh, given you a lot of introduction plus also has have taken you into how the AI has helped uh, and also compared the AI with the uh, spe uh, specialists when uh, the uh, images were shown to them and how the AI outperformed. So I will take you through a few uh, of the work that we have done. Yeah. So before I speak about uh, the AI utility of AI in childhood glaucoma and in uh, JOAG to be precise, because adult glaucoma is something that we have just heard of, I'll also take you through a study that we did. We actually looked at various severities of glaucoma because this is a question that is often asked. Okay, the machine is able to pick up advanced glaucoma. Machine is able to pick up the moderate glaucoma, but what about early glaucoma? So that was the question that we had as well. Doctor, we, just, just one second, Dr. Shisha. Have you changed the slide or is it? We are still seeing your first slide. Yeah. Yes, yes, now it changed. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, it was not moving earlier. No, I didn't move the slide, so. Okay, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so this was a study that we did where we compared the uh, referable glaucoma that was detected by the AI with the diagnosis made by the glaucoma specialist. And this was looked at in various severities of glaucoma. I don't have to go through this image. Uh, now, there was a lot of discussion about how the machine actually detects the changes in the vertical cup disc ratio, as well as the changes in the retinal nerve fiber layer and several other changes which the machine is possibly picking up and we don't know what it is looking at as well. So a prospective study that was done at LV Prasad in um, uh, September to November 2022, we included uh, older patients uh, who had definite glaucoma as diagnosed by the glaucoma specialist. And now the glaucoma specialist did a comprehensive examination of whatever one would do to diagnose glaucoma and also uh, confirm the severity of the disease as well using the visual field test as well as the OCTs. And uh, the machine, on the other hand, was just uh, uh, given a fundus photograph that was taken uh, with the offline uh, AI tool. And the machine was asked to, uh, you know, quantify whether there was glaucoma or no glaucoma, and that is referable glaucoma, which included the suspects as well as the glaucomas. So this was the cohort that was looked at. We included 213 patients, or so 421 eyes to be precise. And uh, looking at the number of patients, so this also included normals. So there was no glaucoma in 51 patients and a glaucoma or a glaucoma suspect in 162. And if you look at the classification here with the star flow diagram, you can see that the, the glaucoma EI system was able to pick up 148 of the referable glaucomas and not able to pick up 14 of those that had glaucoma, but it missed. And among the no glaucomas, it clearly said there was no glaucoma in uh, significant numbers. And there were, there were uh, three patients for whom, the although the patient did not have glaucoma, the machine uh, suggested that it could be either a suspect or a glaucoma and was uh, advised to be referred. This is the confusion matrix showing the same thing. Uh, so the significant number of glaucomas and normals was picked up almost uniformly and there was a small confusion in the area of the glaucoma suspects where the machine was possibly calling it as referable glaucoma or, or possibly was missing the glaucomas in those situations. An example of a true positive where these are the fundus photographs and when the AI is applied, you can actually see the heat maps. You can also see the uh, the changes that are uh, noted. So this is a patient that was referred based on the right eye changes when left eye was completely normal. And you can also see the visual field. Similarly, you can actually see a dense inferior aqueous scotum and a superior nasal step and left was normal. Another example where the right eye and the left eye, if you see, there are broad NFL defects, both superiorly and inferiorly, very minimal cup to disc ratio changes in the right eye, whereas the CDR ratio uh, was slightly more in the left eye. And in this uh, patient, the right eye changes were not picked up by the AI, whereas because, because of the left eye changes that was picked up, this was referred as referable glaucoma. Remember one thing that the machine actually does not tell you whether it is based on right eye or left eye. The referral is based on the patient. So it is even if one eye is picked up, it will still be able to 
refer and here the patient actually had glaucoma in both the eyes but the machine uh, failed to uh, uh, detect the changes in the right eye but was able to pick up changes in the left eye. So how did it perform in all of these cohorts? So sensitivity and specificity of the overall cohort was 91.3% uh, 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 sensitivity and 94.1% specificity. Remember, this was including both the glaucomas and the disc suspects. When we looked at the severity category, among the mild, the it was not bad at all, where it was able to pick up close to 87% of, uh, of the eyes with the mild glaucoma and was able to pick up 90% of those with moderate. And with advanced glaucoma, of course, the, uh, it did very well. So 96% of the time, 96% uh, the advanced glaucoma was picked up by the AI. So the performance clearly increased with increasing severity. So let's look at certain examples, especially coming to those with uh, the younger age group. So in this cohort, we also had juvenile open angle glaucoma. When we did the subgroup analysis, there were seven subjects with JOAG. All the seven subjects were correctly picked up as referable glaucoma by the AI. This is one such example where the patient actually had elevated IOP also and had uh, changes that were noted on the OCT as well. And of course, clinically, you can see the changes that are there. Enlarged cup to disc ratio, thinning of the inferior neuroretinal rim. And the AI was able to pick up correctly. And this were all the other seven patients where the AI was able to pick up the changes that were noted in the optic disc and the retinal nerve fiber layer as referable glaucoma. So we also use this. So we know that all of these changes uh, or whatever AI has been used until now has only been in the adults. And the AI is also trained using the adult optic disc photographs. Now, we wanted to see if actually this could be ut utilized or used in childhood glaucoma because we know the challenges in child in children. Evaluating them becomes very, very difficult. But one thing, we one caveat here is that we know that not, not just the optic disc changes, but we also go by several other changes in a child with glaucoma, starting from enlarged corneal diameter to hap stray to all of that. So keeping that aside, by looking at the optic disc alone, can we pick up glaucoma was the question that we had. This was a small pilot study that we did. We included 17 children, 33 eyes, and with a mean age of 12 years. So the ones who were at least cooperative enough to be able to take a, a fundus photograph, and in few of these also was done under examination under anesthesia. So what is very interesting in them is that the machine was able to, the, the AI was able to pick up glaucoma in significant number of patients, uh, children with, with the actual diagnosis. And in the situations where the AI missed picking up glaucoma, where very interestingly did not have disc changes. That means if let's say a secondary glaucoma, I would call somebody as having a secondary glaucoma based on very high uh, intraocular pressures, but optic discs were healthy. So in those patients, Although the glaucoma specialist called it as glaucoma, uh, but the uh, the AI was not, uh, AI said this was normal or non-referable. That is because the optic disc did not show changes. So that was very, very interesting. And uh, it was quite heartening to see this. These are some examples where you can see these were children with congenital glaucoma. Uh, so the you can see that enlarged cup to disc ratio plus the pallor of the optic disc that you can notice and thinning of the neuroretinal rim. So all of this was picked up as referable glaucoma. So this is case number one, case number two, and case number three. So what is also interesting is that it can give you, although not of a great quality, but anterior segment photograph also it can give you. Maybe once we refine this, we should be able to get the changes of corneal clouding, changes of enlarged corneal diameter and hapstray as well. That would possibly help us to uh, give a combined, uh, in a combined approach can give a better um, a diagnosis. So this was uh, one such patient who was older, like congenital glaucoma, but now was an older child uh, who was also able to perform a visual field. So which, which will actually give you the changes that are there in the optic disc, both structurally and functionally. So I would uh, like to, uh, you know, summarize and say that this offline uh, EI tool 
is very useful in uh, in adults and is also useful in patients with juvenile open angle glaucoma and in children at the moment we know the the data here is very limited with a pilot study but it is definitely encouraging and it would it would help us especially when when uh, you are looking at a situation where you don't have a glaucoma specialist you don't have a pediatric glaucoma specialist but somebody is following up this patients whether it is a general ophthalmologist or an optometrist would definitely be able to use an AI and, and at least look at whether this is referable glaucoma or not. And in the future, possibly additional parameters can be combined and we, we may have uh, improvement in the uh, diagnostic score as well. So there is definitely a way forward and a lot of scope in the future applications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shirisha. Yes. The cases, some of the cases you showed of JOEG are so interesting. Um, before we proceed further, uh, I would like to remind all attendees, if you have any questions to Dr. Shirisha, please continue to post them in a Q&A box. Next on our agenda, we have Dr. Swati from Aravinda Eye Hospital, Pondicherry, who will be discussing about community impact, scalability of glaucoma AI for screening. Dr. Swati, who completed her DNB from Aravind Eye Hospital, Pondicherry. After working as a consultant of, in consultant in general ophthalmology, she completed her glaucoma fellowship at Aravind Eye Hospital, Pondicherry. Since then, she is actively involved in teaching and training the residents and fellows. She has won Best Post Paper Awards in several conferences and she has numerous publications to her name. She is keen on innovations in glaucoma and training young fellows. Without further delay, let's warm welcome Dr. Swati. Dr. Swati, whenever you are ready, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Kanraj. Thank you, Divya, for putting up such a nice program uh, on AI, specifically on AI for glaucoma. And thank you for the nice introduction. I hope my slides are visible and I'm audible. Yes. So I'll be talking about community impact, scalability of glaucoma AI for screening. So what have we been seeing that in the base hospital, like when in the base hospital setting, we, we are doing studies, but proven that this AI works to detect glaucoma, we thought of taking it to the vision centers or to rural population where, where we wanted to test whether it is able to pick up glaucoma or not. So I'm Dr. Swati. I have no financial disclosures. And yeah, so Arvind Eye Care System has always been looking at the non-customers and it always, always wanted to make eye care available, accessible and affordable. This has been our goal throughout from the very beginning. So we have called primary eye care through vision centers. So what are these vision centers? They are like small, uh, uh, small, they are actually small houses or small rooms. In fact, a, a rented room where we have a, a setup of refraction and then sublime evaluation, vision testing and all. And all these vision centers, they provide permanent eye care services to the rural area and they provide, they help in inculcating proactive health seeking behavior in the population of that village or around that village. And this increases the uptake of eye care services. And this helps in reducing the backlog of blindness in the service area population. And these vision centers are around say 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers away from the main hospital. So as of now, we have 100 plus centers covering 15 million population and more than half a million patients visit these vision centers in a year. And 40% these vision centers have a 40% reach. I mean, within the first year, they, reach, they are able to reach 40% of the population. And this reach increases to 75% by the year two. Because as the publicity goes from by mouth to mouth, okay, there is a vision center, we should go and test our eyes and they are doing a very good job and these uh, things got cured. So 85% of the populations are resolved locally by the mid-level mid ophthalmic personals where which whom we have trained at our base hospital. And then they are posted into the vision center to take care of the rural population there. And mostly we pick up, uh, we, we train the girls, the mid-level ophthalmic persons who belong to that specific village. So being a native of that village, they are able to uh, co connect locally and they are able to connect better rather than a pay person coming from outside and the people don't connect or they don't open up. So 
in vision centers we have been adopting newer technologies like from point shoot camera to fundus on phone camera from paper records to electronic medical records and from snell's vision chart to digital vision chart so we have been innovating and we have been incorporating these newer technologies in our vision centers so this is a patient flow in a vision center as you can see, this is a small house. This is a rented house, which has got two rooms, maybe. One is one first room is used for uh, registration and for opticals. And the second room, the patient goes inside. There is a, a vision chart. The sister is doing refraction, and then she's taking a look at the anterior segment. Wherever needed, she does an ablation tonometry. Then pupils are dilated if the angle the AC is not shallow. After dilatation, the sisters, they do 90D fundus examination. And then we thought, okay, let's take a fundus photograph. So we incorporated this Remedio fundus on phone. And beautifully, the sisters take photographs. And believe me, it doesn't require days of training to get trained to use a Remedio fundus camera. So uh, the Remedio people personnel came and they gave just one day training to these sisters. And then they were able to take brilliant photographs. These photographs were transferred via telemedicine to the doctor at the base hospital, where based on only fundus photograph, the doctors gave the diagnosis, okay, whether this patient needs a referral or no referral. So uh, first, regarding service delivery, we have moved from cataract and refractive errors to identify site threatening eye problems. It reduces these vision centers, they reduce the travel-related carbon footprint, and they reduce the cost for the patient both directly in the terms of travel expenses and food expenses to the patient and also indirect costs like loss of wages and attendant required. So to bring the attendant, the attendant also loses the wage of that day. And also early diagnosis reduces the cost and improves the outcome for the provider. So we did a study at vision centers. We included six vision centers for glaucoma study and the rest of the six centers were used for diabetic retinopathy screening. So I'll be talking about the six vision centers where we did the glaucoma study. So we did a prospective study, we included 299 patients and this was only an image-based diagnosis for glaucoma for referral warranted glaucoma which included both glaucoma and disc suspects. And the AI's output was compared with the vision center doctors and these doctors were the glaucoma fellows who have been trained for at least minimum one year in glaucoma clinic. So this is the result we got that according to the AI, the, uh, the normals were 214 and according to the vision center doctors, the normal was 217. And the disc suspects were like 60 by the vision center doctors, but it was just 24 by the AI. So the overall sensitivity when we tested was 73.17, specificity was 98.62, the positive predictive value was 95% and negative predictive value was 90%. This was quite encouraging. So a sub-analysis of 71 patients who were referred either by the vision center doctor or the AI they, uh, was done at the base hospital. And at the base hospital, they underwent all the uh, battery of examinations like uh, Goldman Application Tonometry, CCT, then uh, 90D fundus examination, uh, HFA, OCT. So the, the specialist sitting in the base hospital made a diagnosis based on all these battery of investigations. But the AI and vision center doctors was given just only fundus images. And you can see the AI versus the specialist, the, there was the percentage of agreement was 84.5%. Whereas AI versus teleophthalmologist was 54.9% and specialist versus teleophthalmologist was just 64.7%. This was because of the number of disc suspects. So the, the glaucoma doctors, the glaucoma fellows were like, they don't want to miss any glaucoma. So they over referred the disc suspects. So what we interpreted from the vision center study was that AI detects certain glaucoma, that is definite glaucoma with higher sensitivity than the vision center doctors and reduces the number of over reference of normal cases. AI can potentially be used as a clinician uh, decision support tool to improve diagnostic consistency of the vision center doctors. So the glaucoma fellows, they were, they were knowing that this might be a physiological cup, but they were not sure and they didn't want to miss the glaucoma. So, but the AI, gave the diagnosis, okay, this is not to be referred, this can be referred at six months from now. And also the third point was AI ref uh, performance to detect referable, referral oriented glaucoma when challenged with fundus images was very promising when compared against a specialist with full examination. 
these are some of the scenarios i would like to uh, show this is a case who was referred uh, by the vision center doctor as temporal thinning temporal thinning and that referred and the ai said no referable glaucoma so when the patient came to the base hospital it was diagnosed as normal so you can see it is a 0 0.6 0 0.6 symmetrical cupping with isnt uh, rule being followed and this was actually a physiological cup but the, the good point is this is a non mediatric fundus camera so this patient was referred to the base hospital for a shallow chamber so the ai was the the, the camera was able to take a picture in the undilated pupil and then the uh, the image was given and when we when the patient came to us it was it was actually a pscs patient and then uh, he, one, they underwent she underwent a uh, pa and she is under follow up like whether she PACS is getting converted into PAC, she is under follow, but she is actually at present at the time she is a normal patient. So this is the visual field, but this is the first field which was showing learning defects, and this is the left edge is normal. This is the second case which was referred to the base hospital for a CDR for a higher CDR by the vision center doctor as a disc suspect, but the AI said there is no referable glaucoma, and when all these investigations were done, so the field was normal, and it was. It came out to be a normal. So the clinician said, okay, this is a physiological cupping. Another case where the vision center doctor said referable glaucoma, referable glaucoma, and also the AI said that was actually a glaucoma case because as you can see, it was a 0.9 or 0.85 cupping in both the eyes. And the AI was beautifully uh, pointing out the hot areas. And this is a visual field which shows concentric thinning, a very depressed visual field. And this patient actually was diagnosed as... Uh, yeah, POAG, and, and this patient underwent a trap plus IUL uh, in one eye uh, within four days of the first referral, and the second eye was operated at three months from the first referral. So this was actually uh, very helpful for this patient. Now, uh, so referable glaucoma. Uh, now we did another study that okay, fine. Let's let's do a study at the base hospital. So then we prospectively studied two hundred and fifteen patients at the base hospital where the glaucoma specialist and versus the AI was compared. And as you can see, the sensitivity was 85.9%, specificity was 97%, and the positive predictive value was 98.5%. So we interpreted that AI shows promising results to detect referral warranted cases, despite being challenged with fundus images only. Whereas the glaucoma specialists had uh, access to all the battery of investigations. These are some of those two cases I'll be showing for base hospital uh, uh, base hospital. So this patient was referred from the general unit because the CD ratio was high and uh, the clinical diagnosis was a glaucoma because it's a small disc and uh, AI also said referable glaucoma. So as you can see the right eye had 0.6 cupping, the left eye had 0.9 cupping definitely and these are the two images and see the AI told it's a referable glaucoma although the OCD was showing only temporal thinning in the right eye but the field was showing this early evolving superior arthritis scotoma and in a 10 dash 2 visual fields, yes, left, definitely left eye is glaucomatous. And so this is a second, a second case where the, ref, uh, the AI said there is no referable glaucoma in the right eye, but in the left eye referral. But it was a glaucoma in myopia. And I, I would like you to show the, uh, see the image that right eye is tilted disc and which actually has glaucoma in myopia. But sometimes you just cannot rely on block, uh, on the AI. So it's not that AI is always in, in uh, uh, concordance with the glaucoma specialist. But if it is trained, and if you if you also rely on your clinical evaluation, then you can pick up such cases. So left eye is frank glaucoma, yes, glaucoma in myopia, and right eye also has glaucoma. So this is the right eye fields, which was normal, but the left eye fields was showing superior arcuate and early inferior arcuate scotoma. The OCD is showing bipolar temporal thin, bipolar thinning. So when we compared VC study with the base hospital study, we we found high both both were showing high specificity and the sensitivity was more at the base hospital. Positive predictive value was also above ninety five percent. So this is all I would say that yes, AI is here to stay, and we should we should take up this technology. We should take the good points and we should start incorporating in our daily practice because AI is going to help us. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, Dr. Swati, for such. I can't find the Wi-Fi network. You might want to check the modem or router connections. All right, that's my Google AI doing this job. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, before we proceed, I like to ask all the attendees if you have any questions 
to Dr. Swati, please post them in a Q&A box. I can see some of the questions has been already answered. Please continue typing in your questions here. Next on agenda, we will have an engaging panel discussion. For our panel discussion, I welcome Dr. Kavita S. Yes, from Aravindai Hospital, Pondicherry. Dr. Kavita, Head of Glaucoma Services at Aravindai Hospital, Pondicherry. Dr. Kavita, after completing MS from Aravindai Hospital, Madurai, she joined Aravindai Hospital, Pondicherry as a consultant in, 2020, in 2004. She chose glaucoma as a specialty. Since then, she's actively, actively involved in teaching and training residents and fellows. Welcome, Dr. Kavita. Thank you. Next, I welcome my fellow colleague, Mr. Florin. Florin is in charge for developing AI in Remedio. If you have any burning AI development questions, you can shoot to Florin. Welcome, Florin. And I welcome all our speakers for our panel discussion. Right. So in our panel discussion, I request all the speakers and panel members to keep your video on and unmute yourself whenever you want to answer. My first question to the panel is to Dr. Divya. Dr. Divya, can you please summarize the key takeaways from these four presentations? I think we had a really great session, a uh, lot of very good talks. I think my key takeaways would be that uh, one is definitely technology is here to stay, here to help us improve our patient outcomes. AI is not something about the future. It is now, it is already there and we need to really embrace the fact that it's there and can help us. Um, the other thing, uh, I think one of the main messages is that we really need to ensure that before AI is deployed, prospective studies are done and the AI is evaluated against a robust reference standard to ensure that it's doing well in the population it's being used. Um, I think from all of the talks, it's clear that there can be different use cases of the AI. It could be useful for a general ophthalmologist, uh, a glaucoma specialist, or in the community for health workers. Um, and depending on, I think, the context in which the AI is used, the screening protocol can be optimized. Uh, if there's a teleophthalmologist, it can be a hybrid model. If there is no ophthalmology present, you can use the decision as a screening uh, report before an ophthalmologist actually confirms it. Um, but it is also clear that there are certain limitations of the AI. And we need to understand the limitations before actually deploying it. And important to understand that this is a screening report and not looking at um, avoiding a visit to the ophthalmologist. I think those were the few key takeaways that I had from all of the wonderful talks. My next question is uh, to Dr. Shirisha. Uh, Dr. Shirsha, how do you think this can help in general ophthalmologists? They already do IOP and fundus evaluation. How can this AI can be an integral part of their practice? Yeah, I think um, so. I would I would actually let's say take a step back and um, tell about the population based study that we published in. Uh, the EPEDS that was published and looked at glaucoma. And I'm sure the same was with Aravinda as well as Shankarnetralaya. You know that in India, while in the West, you say 50% of the glaucoma in the community is not diagnosed and blah, blah, blah. But in India, more than 90% of the glaucomas are not diagnosed. But what is very, very disturbing is that of those that were diagnosed, at least 50% of the patients had seen an ophthalmologist prior. Meaning they had seen an ophthalmologist and the glaucoma was not picked up. So I would look at it this way. I'm not saying that the uh, general ophthalmologists don't do a good job. I think glaucoma is a gen comprehensive ophthalmologist skill that each and every person who does ophthalmology should know to pick up a glaucoma. But the, the training level is very different and it is not easy to pick up glaucoma because if you look at those images, it's not easy. Even for a specialist, sometimes you may have to take a second look at it and you may have to have a depth uh, view of what, what subtle changes are happening in the optic disc. You have to have a, 
better exposure patient is not allowing you to uh, uh, you know look because of the bright light they they just give you a few seconds to take a look at the posterior segment and all of us also are able to, are, are sometimes a missing uh, a, a change i'm talking about glaucoma specialist and then look at the general ophthalmologist there's a very high likelihood that the glaucoma was possibly missed and the, i'm talking about moderate to advanced glaucomas so you have population based data that tells you that the glaucomas in the community are missed not just because they are not screened or they are even going and seeing a specialist but the glaucoma is getting missed so if you if to just put the perspective uh, this is what i would look at it as that if you have you you are, you are a general ophthalmologist you are not very sure whether there is glaucoma or not and then you anyway have to document a fundus photograph let's say if it is an optic uh, the diabetic retinopathy or something else that you find in the uh, uh, in the posterior segment a photograph a, gen, a, a a posterior segment photograph including the optic disc and the posterior pole actually gives you so much more information and if you are applying a ai to it all you have to do is click a button and then that will tell you whether there is this problem or that problem or that needs to be referred or not so at least the doctor will be comfortable enough that they are not missing the disease uh, and uh, i think that is that is the benefit that it would give to a general ophthalmologist and also this is a non mediatic camera so if you are so busy the patient is busy you are busy uh, you you know they are not willing to wait all you have to do is click a photograph and i i can tell you from the experience for children they're quite comfortable in fact first when the remedio thing came i am uh, to take a picture it is not too bright if you have to take a photograph it's very bright right it can sometimes be an examination can be even difficult uh, especially when your pupils are dilated and the light is too bright so a non mediatic fundus photograph can help you to decide whether to uh, refer the patient or not and to me that is really useful yeah just a follow up question to that you said it can be even done to children how how long it takes uh, to do this uh, uh, photographs if so if the child is able to fix it if you have nystagmus if you have a corneal scar and things like that it becomes very difficult because of course the quality of the image ultimately is most important but if the child is able to fix it and uh, all it takes is a few seconds to capture a image so it doesn't take much time right okay my my next question is to dr shrijani uh, dr shrijani with fundus imaging and ai does that mean ophthalmologists do not need oct and hfa okay. unmute yourself dr shrijani yes, please you need to unmute yeah Yes, sorry. Um, so definitely, we can't do away with uh, visual fields and OCT because that's something which, uh, just like how visual fields and OCT are investigation modalities, AI is just uh, helping you with uh, investigation and like managing the patient. You can't do away with visual fields and OCT because those are the standards. Because until AI reaches that stage where we can actually quantify the changes and progression to the extent what visual fields and OCT is doing, definitely we can't do away with that. We still need it. But AI can be used as a screening for those patients uh, whom you're suspecting glaucoma and you need these uh, investigations done. At least for those patients, you can uh, definitely. So this AI is something that you have to do for at least all your patients whoever comes and you have that suspicion but visual fields and oct you definitely can't do away with it something part of glaucoma workup which has to be there yeah yeah agree with you um next question is to dr swati so dr swati how do you think this technology can be used in teaching and training at aia have you used it at your rnai hospital yes we have we are using and we we have been using from the time it, the study was done so the fellows got trained uh, almost all the fellows got trained but then they also started learning okay they also got confident in saying that okay this can be physiological cup and then they said okay we can we can refer it after say 3 months or 6 months from now you can come for a checkup so they it helped in their learning also and also in our vision centers we have don't have always glaucoma fellows posted so we have residents also posted over there so residents also got exposed to this images and what they used to ignore 
then they started looking into it when the ai used to give them okay this is 0.6 cupping okay then they used to revisit and then re see that image and then they also started learning okay then they were excited that madam we saw a notch today we saw so before coming to glaucoma clinic also like when they were posted in vision centers they started learning from there itself so the ai has helped the sisters the doctors and the fellows all of them that's right fantastic fantastic um dr kavita uh, have you incorporated this ai in all your primary uh, you know care centers and have you tried any other modalities for screening glaucoma in your model uh, yeah i think uh, dr swati beautifully demonstrated uh, the video uh, the regular functioning of our vision center so to start with uh, in the vision centers previously even before this fund is on phone was available we have uh, always used technology we used a digital camera and then attached it to the slit lamp with an adapter and then we were capturing images so that our tele ophthalmologist can uh, know comment on those images and uh, uh, do uh, uh, decide on the reference but with the availability of the technology now uh, in all our vision centers we have uh, this remedio technology with the uh, ai and uh, now no the things have become very simple so though we were initially using uh, other fundus cameras or even a digital camera with adapter definitely it was taking time and uh, as rightly suggested by dr swati there is a lot of learning also going on because our vision centers they don't have trained technicians these are all mid level ophthalmic personnels who are getting trained in their uh, no patient evaluation they undergo with the experience they learn and i think with this ai their learning is also becoming enriched like uh, no they too learn uh, from based on the ai reference so and regarding the outreach initially like uh, we were screening with intraocular pressure or a direct ophthalmoscopy and i feel like uh, there is also a great scope which we have not yet tried taking this technology to outreach uh, program where definitely it will uh, uh, increase our uh, glaucoma referrals multiple time because unlike diabetic retinopathy glaucoma screening in the community is like uh, really really challenging because diabetics if somebody is giving history of diabetes then the only those population you can dilate and evaluate but here so no you cannot rely on any history though of course family history and things like that and uh, no uh, can be there but still when you go for a population based screening probably this will be the way to look forward thank you um my next question is to florin florin uh, we are talking about this offline ai model here uh, what are the challenges to bring this AI model offline? I think there are two main challenges. The the first one you need to when you start the development of the model, you need to keep in mind that this is going to be deployed on a um, on a on a smartphone. So you need to keep your model size uh, pretty lightweight. Uh, neural networks come in different architectures, different sizes. It can go from pretty easy to very complex. You need to choose the right architecture to keep it lightweight enough so that it runs on a smartphone, but the accuracy still needs to be there. There's always a trade-off between um, accuracy and how much computational power a new network um, uh, takes. The other aspect is to choose the right device on which to, to deploy. When we deploy on an iPhone, that's a device that already has some uh, AI features. Hey Siri is one of them. So there is already some um, uh, chips and um, the upper ecosystem give developers way, ways to deploy uh, models, AI models in an efficient way. So we need to uh, make use of uh, those tools. Yeah. So does it mean that that AI tool that now works only with the iPhone, like can we use any other model phone or can it be work online as well? It can work online as well as uh, in a survey. So it's actually always easier to deploy it online compared to uh, to offline. And on Android devices, uh, nowadays there's also ways to potentially deploy as well. Um, the next question is to Dr. Shirisha. Dr. Shirisha, what happens if there is a dissuspect or early glaucoma? Does AI miss us? So early glaucoma is like... Uh... Uh, what I briefly showed, uh, close to about 89% the AI is able to pick up. 
as against the glaucoma specialist diagnosis. The glaucoma suspects, so when somebody calls, so um, I think glaucoma suspect category is something that we shouldn't give too much of importance to because if that is a suspect, it's a suspect. It doesn't mean that there is glaucoma. So we shouldn't worry too much about, uh, you know, referring them as well. But in the patients with glaucoma suspect, a few of them based on the cup disc ratio is too large, just like how all of us are not able to diagnose, you need additional information, you need visual fields, you need OCT, whatever, whatever. So I don't think you can, uh, you can expect it from an AI to say whether the suspect is actually glaucoma or, or normal. So all it tells you is the vertical CD ratio is larger, I mean, because of the uh, CDR being larger, most of the suspects are so. Uh, and then it says that you need to keep a watch. So or even if it says referable glaucoma or not a referable glaucoma, I wouldn't give too much of importance to it at the moment. But early glaucomas, if you see close to about very close to 90%, it is still able to pick up. 10% it is still missing. And I showed an example where there were NFL defects, but classical NFL defects, which clinically you would be able to pick up, but the AI missed it. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not 100%. So we need to understand that. But suspects don't, I don't think we should worry too much about them at the moment. Okay. Um, Dr. Divya, what are the limitations of this AI? Like, is there any specific disk changes or something that one should be cautious when we are using this AI? So one thing uh, definitely is that the AI, this particular AI is disease specific. Uh, particularly looking at referable glaucoma. Of course, we have other different models looking at diabetic retinopathy, AMD, cataract, etc. But this is disease specific. So if you were to capture someone with, uh, say, uh, with a CRVO or BRVO and run the glaucoma AI, and it is normal, uh, means there is no glaucoma, it would not pick it up. We need different models for different diseases. Uh, as Dr. Silesia pointed out, I think the sensitivity of the tool varies with severity of disease. Um, it does uh, promisingly well on moderate to advanced cases. And the idea of the tool was that, as pointed out, 90% of them are undetected. The idea was to identify as many as possible who would imminently go blind. Um, but yes, uh, there is scope of improvement for early glaucomas as well as challenging and rare cases. Like Sujini also pointed out, myopic discs and tilted discs are a challenge even for glaucoma specialists. You need a battery of investigations to ensure that, um, uh, that it is glaucoma and you actually need to confirm them over time and see if there is progression and then you take a decision whether to treat or not. So when you're doing it at a single time point and these cases do get challenging, uh, I think these are some of the limitations of the AI. But as a first step, what we were essentially looking at, how can you pick those who are going blind immediately? That was the uh, um, reason behind developing this account. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kavita, have you integrated this AI in your workflow, uh, Arvind? So I think uh, my first question itself answered this, like we have integrated as of now in the primary eye care centers called our vision centers, because here we don't have doctors to examine every patient. Though we have the facility of teleconsultation with the ophthalmologist at the base hospital. So on a given day, depending upon the number of patients at each of the vision center, it won't be happening for every patient. So unless until the MLOP or the technician who's handling that is having a query, they will be presenting that to the teleophthalmologist. Otherwise, they have to decide. So this is definitely uh, playing a huge role uh, in those cases. And also, I would like to share one more experience where like uh, we, as I was I was talking about the population-based screening. So interestingly, last year during the World Glaucoma Week, uh, uh, we had a you know, screening program with uh, uh, glaucoma-related messages distributed to all those who were uh, uh, coming to the mall uh, in one of the malls at, uh, at Pondicherry. And we had a few of them like who were willing for a screening just to undergo the screening process also. So we were using uh, eye care tonometer and also Remedia fundus on phone with the AI. And out of the 500 patients like who underwent uh, evaluation or the screening at the mall, 
almost like uh, 30, 35 of them were detected with some fundus pathology, either glaucoma or some uh, macular disease or some like, uh, you know, uh, dyspaler or, uh, you know, diabetic retinopathy. It's almost like 6% of them had some preferable posterior segment disease. Mm -hmm. So that is how like uh, it can be like utilized. And as I said, uh, probably the way forward, we have to take it to our outreach as well. Thank you. Um, next question is to Florin. Florin, we saw this colorful heat maps uh, in the AI report. Uh, I know in AI terms, these are called class activation maps. What are they? How they are generated? Okay, let me try to give an answer that's not too uh, technical. So you need to go to the way the neural networks uh, work. And yeah. these are organized in different layers. And most of the layers retain uh, where in the image the information is. And at some point in the neural network, those are being merged. Uh, all the different locations of the image are being merged to create the final output. What class activation maps do is that it's looking at the output right before this merging happens. Mm -hmm. And that way you have most of the information that has already been process processed, but you still have the location in the image where this has uh, happened. Can I, can I simply put it, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, these are the regions where the AI or the neural network thinks there is some problem. Can I say Exactly. It? Yep. Yep. Right. Um, next question is to Dr. Divya. Dr. Divya, what is the ideal sensitivity and specificity for glaucoma screening? Uh, I mean, how it works? In, in 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 media opacity cases what what happens to your sensitivity and specificity can you also comment on that so coming to your first question on the ideal sensitivity and specificity actually there is no predicate device out there as i mentioned that there are no benchmarks so we are looking at comparing against current reference standards and see how it does um Unlike in the case of diabetic retinopathy, where the regulator had set benchmarks, there's nothing like that for glaucoma screening. However, I think it basically depends on the context in which AI is being deployed. If it is in the uh, population setting, the tool definitely needs to be more. Ideal tool, of course, is you have as high sensitivity and specificity as possible. Uh, but this is not always possible because it's a trade-off and you'll have to see try and get it as sensitive or as specific as possible based on the context. So if it is in the population, we know the prevalence of disease is low. So you don't want to be over referring patients there. The specificity of the tool needs to be high. If you're using it within the clinic where you know the caseload of those with glaucoma walking in is high, you want the tool to be more sensitive. So depending on the context, the optimization is dependent. For example, I just want to give an example on SDOCT, right? The sensitivity of the tool is 0.79 and specificity is about 0.9. And if you look at intraocular pressure measurement, the sensitivity is only 0.48 because we know that there are a lot of uh, yeah. those who have normal tension glaucoma, right? Yeah. So um, none of these have been a single tool that has been used for screening. So we do not know the exact number but based on the context, you can optimize the sensitivity and specificity. Uh, on the second question, like what happens to the sensitivity and specificity if there is a media opacity? That's one. And how many percentage of people will get poor quality images? What happens to the AI output in that case? Right. So as I mentioned, there is a quality check algorithm that is inbuilt into the AI. So unless the images are of sufficient quality for the AI to analyze, it will not analyze the image and it will give a feedback saying, repeat the images. And after that, it will say refer the patient. So um, definitely there is a minimum image quality required for the AI to run and that uh, has to be met. Um, in terms of image quality itself, it is a function of age and media opacity as well as pupil size, as we know. And in those less than 40 years, what we have generally seen is the image quality is very high. Over 95% of them are always good quality images. 
as the age uh, progresses and those over 60 years because of media opacity and smaller pupils the image quality is about 60 to 70 percent that's what we are generally seeing right. uh, my next question is to dr sharisha dr sharisha what is the role of optometrist in this how important they are in this using this ai tool for glaucoma screening yeah, so anybody who's trained to take a fundus photograph, I think can use it. It's nothing in particular, whether it's an optometrist or a, or a technician or a nursing assistant, whoever it is. They need to understand uh, whether, like whatever uh, Dr. Divya just said, whether there is any media opacity, can this be performed or not? Is there significant cataract? So for that, uh, the optometrist role is there to say whether it can be done or not. But apart from that, I don't think uh, in particular optometrists need, would, to, be a training, would need yes. to be trained in doing the uh, yeah. testing. The idea can be any technician can take Anybody a simple can. photo. Yeah. 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 The role of optometrist or ophthalmologist is can this be done? Is it needed? Yes, that's right. That is where they can help. That's right. Yeah. Um, my next question is to Florian. Florian, how is patient pro data is protected with this AI system? I think the, the fact that we deploy the AI offline on the device means there's no communication to an external server. So the images remain on the device and you can have an assessment without an internet connection, which means that the privacy of the, uh, the patient is, um, is guaranteed. We also have within the Remedio device some options for cloud backup within a Remedio Connect. Those uh, have passed all the, the quality, the data privacy standards, um, uh, HIPAA and, and GDPR and so on. But the, the AI itself runs offline, which means there's no privacy concerns here because the, the image stay on the phone. Yeah, just, just a question on AI. I mean, I'm also curious on this. This also came as many survey questions that when we sent out this invite to webinar, how many images does it require to train? Like we always say that, oh, AI requires many images to train. Can you put some number to it? I get asked this question so many times by the clinical team, how many images do we need to gather and so on? I never have like a, a concrete answer yeah. because um, it, it's really hard to predict upfront how the AI will be learned, uh, able to learn uh, with a new task. So you you try with a small data set, you see how it goes, and you add more images afterwards. But there are a few general trends um, out there. It depends on the, the complexity of the task. For example, in the case of diabetic retinopathy, if you do a yes or no, you yeah. have all the different stages that goes from a few lesions here and there to a, um, a big bleed in the, in the image. So there, it's actually a wide range of cases to be covered within the positive um, uh, section. And the more you narrow down, the the less images uh, you need. So in in the case of glaucoma, we already have a new network that just crops the disk, yeah. so which means the AI doesn't need to learn to only look at the disk because it's only being presented uh, with the disk. And yeah. then there's another model that is does uh, VCDR. So the the range um, that the AI needs to to learn is a bit smaller. So you can do away with um with less images. But it's really something that is uh, problem specific and that is uh, pretty hard to to predict up front. It's yeah. it's at the end of the day, it's a trial and error process. Yeah. Um, Doctor Dima, what is the medical legal liabilities for misdiagnosis? What if if AI misses the case? Who is liable for that? AI or ophthalmologist? So I think uh, one thing we really need to emphasize that I also mentioned during uh, my talk is that we there's a disclaimer in the report that this is a screening report. The AI is only analyzing and providing a screening report and this does not eliminate the need to visit an ophthalmologist. That's one. And when you're using as a clinical assist tool, like with any other investigations like HVF or OCT, like, for example, OCT has segmentation errors. In small and large discs, you know that it's not very reliable. And HVF can have false positive, false negative. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that it is, at the end of the day, the clinical judgment of the ophthalmologist is essential, uh, especially in the hands of an ophthalmologist. So 
at the end of the day, it will be the ophthalmologist decision. For autonomous use in the community, I think we are looking at the benefit of those who have missed screening itself. I mean, the entire cohort is not getting screened. So you are going to identify those who are missed. But uh, there again, the final diagnosis will lie with the ophthalmologist to whom the patient is eventually referred after the initial screening. But if there is no oversight of an ophthalmologist at the time of screening, I think the liability will have to take on as AI manufacturers. Right. I was just going through the questions. I think the majority of the questions has been answered here. Um, let me ask one final question and let me shoot it to Dr. Shirisha. Um, Dr. Shirisha, do you think AI will replace ophthalmologist? Mm. Hmm. That's an interesting question, like everything else. So, <laughs> yeah, AI will not replace ophthalmologists. But a uh, very interesting thing that I heard somewhere is that uh, the ophthalmologists who are not uh, embracing AI will be replaced. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a fantastic answer. <laughs> I think I agree with you. The, those who don't use the technology will be replaced in the future. Right. Thanks a lot. I think... We are good with the timing, so I'll just conclude. Thank you to all panelists for giving such an in insightful discussion, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, before I conclude, I like to express my gratitude to all our attendees for your active participation and thoughtful questions throughout the webinar. Your engagement has contributed greatly to our success today. As we come to our webinar, I encourage you to continue to explore the topics discussed today to stay informed about advancements in glaucoma care. Remember, the journey towards improving eye health for all is ongoing and your continuous support and involvement are crucial. On behalf of Remedio, I would like to express our sincere appreciation to our speakers, panelists, attendees, and everyone involved in making this webinar possible. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are looking forward to see you at such a future events. Wish you a wonderful evening. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye.